Nigel Farage, you have criticised the establishment parties. Let me quote something at you. As the 7% that go to public schools, dominate politics, the media, the arts, sport, every aspect of our life in this country, we've almost reached a situation where the only time these guys have met a working class man or woman is if they're driving the car. Yes. Tell us about your schooling. Yeah, I was very lucky. Um, I went to a school called Dulwich College in South London, uh, which has been there for nearly 400 years. It's a public uh, school. Which was it? founded for 12 poor scholars um, and was all paid for by a benefactor. And interestingly, um, it was a tradition that they kept for many, many years. And after World War II, uh, up until the year that I went there, 50% of the boys in my year uh, came from working class backgrounds and were paid for by local education authorities you as, part one of of, those, though. as part of what was called the Assisted Places Scheme. Um, I wasn't one of those, no. But the interesting thing was that through school and then through working in the metals industry on the London Metal Exchange, you know, I always work with and I've always mixed with a very large cross-section of society. Well, look, let's just be clear about this. By about 1990, you'd been to a public school, you were working in the city and you had been a long member, a long-standing member of the Conservative Party. Now, some would say it's a bit of a barefaced <laughs> cheek for you to say to the others, "Oh, you all establishment public well, school ah, types." Come what, on. But what the others are saying is, "I'm all right, Jack. Let's pull up the ladder and not give people who didn't have the same opportunities as us the chance to get on." And what I'm saying is that actually it's wrong that the seven percent now dominate more and more and more, and that something something is actually missing. You know, why is it? Uh, we haven't got more people in politics or the media uh, that have come through well, the I'm state school system. The parties are and I think, with this. and I think the answer is pretty obvious. You know, I think one of the biggest social mistakes we've made over the course of the last 50 years was to abolish hundreds of grammar schools, many of which had for, had for centuries given people from all backgrounds the chance to attain their best. And the evidence for that is the recent Ofsted report that said that two thirds of the brightest youngsters are not attaining their best Look, I'm, I'm focusing on your criticism of the other parties for being, if you like, yes. establishment. Can yes. we just talk about some of your, what you call, people's army, OK? You're the commander, but yeah. the generals. Um, William Dartmouth, your foreign affairs spokesman, is he a kind of anti-establishment character? He's the 10th Earl of Dartmouth. He went to Eton. Yes, the um, deputy leader of UKIP is called Paul Nuttall. He comes from Bootle. Um, Stuart the, Wheeler, well, on, he was I'm, part of no, the no, 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 anti-establishment. No, 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 no. And our immigration spokesman, Stephen Wolfe, comes from Mossside, which I think at one point in time <laughs> was the roughest estate in the whole of the country. And that's the point about UKIP. Neil we Hamilton, anti-establishment, former Tory MP. We have got... Douglas Carswell, one of your MPs, we have educated got the most at Charter House. Mark Reckless from Mul Mul Marlborough. And what, I mean, and, and so tell me, and, and no, no. tell me another party. Tell me, tell but all me another parties party. have people from public schools. I'm not got? suggesting that going to a public school disqualifies you from politics. Well, I think you're, you're missing, the one you are who missing, pointed out the other parties. You are missing the point about UKIP completely. Yes, you can quote the posh people in UKIP, and we've got them, of course Look, we have. Half the people but, who you describe as key but, people on your website are privately educated or Oxbridge educated. But you look at the number of genuinely working class people in UKIP, in senior positions in UKIP, and it's way ahead of the other parties. And, I, right. and, 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 well, and we try to do things as a meritocracy. You, you, let's look at the policies, because you've said you want to help ordinary people. Yep. But when we look at the tax cuts you're proposing, one of them is to abolish inheritance tax. That's something that benefits the richest 6% of uh, families and <laughs> estates. You want to cut the top rate of tax. No, we don't. And you want to raise the 40p band. Well, you, you ought to do your research a bit better because you're wrong about the top rate of tax. We're not proposing at this... long-term aspiration to get yeah, the 45p but, but, rate but, but down it, to 40 But it's not in this manifesto because right. it's not a priority. Okay. It's mentioned we in the manifesto. Have, since 2006, we've campaigned for no tax on the minimum wage. When we first said it, we were isolated. The Liberal Democrats picked up with that, and now others are beginning to follow us. So we've been arguing for taking a low paid out of tax for a very, very long time. What we're now arguing is that there is a squeeze middle. There are people out there who are experienced nurses or police officers who are paying 40p tax, a level that was designed to be for those earning a very great deal of money. And frankly, you know, if you're living in, a, in an expensive part of the country, 40p is, is too much tax for those people. So we're looking at lifting right. the bans significantly. The bans. So, so you're right to say we want to abolish inheritance tax. We've said that for a very, very long time. And that, of course, is because the very rich don't get dragged into inheritance tax because they have long-term tax planning. And that actually, in the London suburbs, 
you know, now, the, the, the average semi-detached house, the average semi-detached house takes you over the IHT let's, threshold. Let's, let, let's move on. And one of the great mysteries of, of, of British politics, or maybe it's not such a mystery, is that there's quite a high level of public support for some of the things that UKIP stands for. Control of immigration. <coughs> yeah. There are plenty of people who don't like the EU in this country. You, yeah. you could probably quote the figures better than I can. And yet, in the polls, 85% of the population say they're not going to vote UKIP. And even at your absolute peak in the European elections, you're still at sort of 70% of the population who don't choose to vote UKIP. So somehow you're scoring lower than the policies. Well, actually. Is this, is this because there are a lot of people who think UKIP just has a faint whiff of meanness about it or is a divisive party? No, I mean, look, you know, uh, given, given the history of British politics, for UKIP to have got to where it's got to is pretty remarkable. I mean, there have been the, the scores of attempts over the last 60 or 70 years to get new parties off the ground, most of which, you know, have absolutely bombed. And, 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 and this is not a top-down party. This was a grassroots welling up. I meet people on my doorsteps every day who say, I completely agree with you, but we're going to vote Labour because we always have done, or I'm going to vote Tory because we always have done. So we have a political system in Britain that chiefly, I think, because of the first-past-the-post system, does keep a certain tribal loyalty to a colour. You know, we're reds or we're blues, as opposed to issues. On your second point, I mean, there has been, and I think this is because we're taking on the establishment, and I think this happens not just in politics, it happens in science, it happens in business. If you take on the consensus, uh, they make life very hard for you. There has been a very consistent attempt to try and paint UKIP out to be right. something that it isn't. I wonder, I mean, that could all be true. I wonder actually whether it's something to do with your tone and, I'm, and, and the way you talk about the issues such as immigration, uh, which is a big part of your programme. Yeah. I want us to look at a clip of you. Now, this is you speaking to Fox Television in the US, not to voters here, mm -hmm. earlier this year. Let's just have a look at that clip and get a comment. Wherever you look, wherever you look, you see this blind eye being turned and you see the growth of ghettos where the police and all the normal agents of the law have withdrawn and that is where Sharia law That's has come Paris, in. Yeah. Indeed. So where are these ghettos? Where yeah. are these ghettos? Well, if you go to any part of France and speak to any French politician, they will tell you there are no, a lot you're talking about the no, UK. You're yeah. talking well, that particular interview, I was talking about France, actually. So, so, no, this but, is, but, but this is but, about the but, UK. No, this is about I have UK. not said that. What I have said about the UK, well, certainly the bit I have said is... You've the, said there the, are no the go areas eye. in France, but this yeah, was, the, I yes. think, about the UK. Yeah, Definitely what, about the UK. What, what, what I was saying about the UK, and I think, again, I think they're different interviews, but nonetheless, what I've said about the UK is that uncontrolled mass immigration has led to increasing division and ghettoization in our towns and cities. Are there areas, are there areas where the police, where the police and normal agents of the law have withdrawn and where Sharia has come in? Uh, not in, uh, well, you could argue there are parts of the country where it's happened. In France, it's a much bigger problem than it is here. And that's what I was talking about. But, but, you know, there are. It, 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 We've had it even the Archbishop. About France, it was about the UK. Well, I, I, I and doubt. You said wherever I you look. That. I doubt that. Wherever you look. I think you're wrong. But anyway, the point is this: even up to the last Archbishop of Canterbury, we've had people saying that Sharia law should be acceptable in our cities. Now, you know, well, our I think, history. I think he was somewhat misunderstood in that, and I think he well, was. Perhaps he was we all, well, perhaps sometimes well, on these issues we, we all have get Jewish courts sometimes in this country. Yeah. We have Jewish courts in this country. We you, do. Are you against those? Against no, those? No. What I'm what I'm talking about is what is, you know, primary law. What is right. the law but of the land? And are we... So you, you resile from the we, phrase, wherever you look, you see yeah. a blind eye being turned, you see the growth of ghettos and Sharia law coming well, the, in. Well, you, just, you didn't well, say it. Well, the blind, eye, the blind eye has been okay. turned, and we've seen the consequences of right. that in some of our big Let's northern cities. And with, frankly, and with, frankly, some of the most appalling... Uh, sexual scandals that I think we've seen in our history, yes, and that you, directly you raise because, these issues. You call directly yourself, because the blind eye was turned. Right. You call yourself straight talking. Now, last year you took out a full page ad in the Daily Telegraph. Yep. You claimed that seven percent of all crime across the uh, EU member states was caused by 240 Romanian gangs. Mm -hmm. Now that wasn't correct, was it? I believe it was. No, it was seven percent of all gang 
uh, of criminal gangs were 240 Romanian gangs, not 27% of all crime. Well, now, if you're going to be straight well, talking, well, if you're going to hit, I think what that when you're, you're straight talking, where you're going to hit these so-called taboo issues that no one else talks about, yeah. then you need well, to be I a think, bit careful. I think, what, I, th I think what that advert said also was there had been 28,000 arrests of one particular nationality, of one particular nationality within the metropolitan police area over the space of right. last and I know years. some people quibbled with those figures as well. I didn't go well, into those because well, no it's harder to get data on those, yeah. so it's harder to be sure. But we can be sure that you misunderstood the data about Romanian gangs. Does it worry you that if you sound off on foreign criminals, mm. foreigners with HIV, you talk about our borders open to hundreds of millions of people? Which they are. All of these things may be true. Mm. There are people with HIV. There are foreign criminals. Mm. All of these may be true. But if mm. you make such a big, <coughs> if you ramp up the rhetoric on these issues, many British people will say, look, this party is just not where I want it to be with well, modern British values of tolerance, worldliness, and being a good to wake people citizen. up, To wake people up to, to, to the truth of what's going on, uh, you sometimes have to say things in a way to get noticed. Uh, that was no question. However, however, Political parties evolve and change. And if you look at the way UKIP is fighting this general election, everything through our manifesto, to all the speeches I've given all over the country, what I'm saying is this. We no longer need to make the negative arguments about the effect that immigration has had on primary school places, on healthcare provision, on, 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 on wage compression. The argument we are now making is that we're the one party that firstly offers a solution, which is to take back control of our borders, and secondly, has a positive and an ethical vision for how immigration should be managed by having an Australian-style point system. And I think, so I, I, I think you know, that you But you know, I'm actually not quibbling with the policy. I'm not even, yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really trying to talk to you about the <coughs> policy. I'm trying to talk to you about the tone. Let's move on. You've talked well, about well, and, a fifth and, column. And, 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 I'm answering, hate us. and I'm answering by saying this to you, by saying, that in order to get the public aware of some of these issues, perhaps at times that tone had to be used. But you are well, not hearing, so you... but hang on, you are not hearing, and you're interviewing me now as we approach a general election, you are not hearing that tone you from heard, me. You talked about in a fifth column. You yes. talked about a fifth column this year. This is within a few months. Yes. You talked about a, a fifth column. The Muslim religion, people who come and don't want to be part of our culture. There's no the, previous I'm, experience in our I, history of a migrant whoa, group coming whoa, to whoa, Britain whoa, 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 that wants whoa, whoa, to change whoa, whoa. who we are. I haven't talked about the Muslim religion like that. But this I've is, I'm quoting about, you. I'm I've quoting you about, from I've January. Talk, I've talked about a mercifully small percentage of the Muslim population. So if you're going to quote me, let's get it right, OK? A mercifully small percentage of the Muslim religion. Who is the fifth column? Well, the fifth column are those within that wish to fight us. Now, look, I... Are those who sympathise? I sympathize, do not. Those, I do not. Those who sympathise with Charlie Hebdo, for example, would they be a fifth column? Uh, those that are prepared to act upon it would be a fifth column. Right. And, as we know, so those who something like be, yeah. 700, maybe 1,000 British people have gone to fight right. in Syria. So we know this exists. We have seen examples of this in France. We've seen examples of this in Britain. We've seen examples of this in Denmark. Should we be, should we be concerned about it? Yes, of course we should. Of course we should. You've talked um, about Muslims. You've talked about no, Judeo I'm sorry, Christian. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, you've I'm, talked no, about. You no, mentioned no, no, Muslims. No, no, I'm not okay, having this. Well, okay, well, let's no, put I'm that not aside. having this. Put I, that aside. I'm not. Aside. No, I'm not going to put that aside. I have said. Okay, you've talked about some Muslims. A mercifully you've talked small about some percentage. Some of the people who've come so here and who clear. are of the Muslim so religion. So let's be clear. Some of the people who've come here and who are of the Muslim religion. You've talked about Judeo-Christian heritage. Yes. You talk of being uncomfortable on a train where everyone else is speaking a different language. You've talked in recent days of giving homes to Christian refugees and uh -huh. only Christian uh, refugees from the troubled zones of the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. Aren't people entitled to think that as a party and you as the leader are happier with some migrants than other migrants based on ethnic or national background and nothing to do with the skills or the languages that they bring? What, do you think it would? I mean, do you think it would be a good idea if you had a, 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 you know, if you were running your own immigration policy, which of course Britain doesn't, because we're EU members? Do you think it'd be a good idea to get a lot of people to come who didn't speak English? Do you think that that, that would aid and abet integration in society? Well, the answer, of course, to that clearly mm. is no. Do I think? Do you favour some immigrants? Let's suppose one from Mogadishu with the same skills, the same ability to speak English, but not mm. as a first language, mm. from one from Melbourne. Are I you, do, have do you have a, a slight, preference? Do you have I, a preference? I have to confess, I do have a slight preference. 
I do think, naturally, that people from India and Australia are in some ways more likely to speak English, understand common law and have a connection with this country uh, than some people that come perhaps from countries that haven't fully recovered from being behind the Iron Curtain. But, but, but that's irrelevant. When you have an Australian style point system, what you do is you take out of that all subjectivity and you look at things on a purely objective right. basis. So you don't do, give points do, for being do, do, do people, Australian or points no, for no, being no, Judeo-Christian? No. no, you get points because you've got languages and skills. But you, why wouldn't you? Because you, you just said points. you'd prefer the Judeo-Christian or the Commonwealth no. immigrants. Well, well uh, yeah, I, I look, this country has long associations and links with Australia with India, with countries right. like that, all right? And we have been friends together in crisis many, many times. And what we've done is we've turned our backs on them. We've turned our backs on them in terms of trade <laughs> by making life very difficult for them. Um, and we've really, we've really become a country whose political elite and much of whose media elite are totally incapable of thinking about the world outside the European well, club. You, you, you say that, in fact, your manifesto says the liberal metropolitan elite mm -hmm. often tells us mm -hmm. patriotism is wrong. Mm -hmm. Who is this liberal metropolitan elite who says patriotism is wrong? Well, I think you only have to look at the tweet, uh, that, and I won't name her because that would be really quite nasty, but a, a certain Labour MP uh, you know, put out a tweet of a chap with a white van and with a cross of St George outside his house, as if to say, look at these ghastly people. And there is too much of that. There is too much snobbery. And actually, that's what it's about. It is London-based snobbery about the way ordinary folk feel and, and, you know, out there in the country, a lot of people are wonder, unashamedly patriotic. And that's considered whether, to be awful in London. I don't, I, don't think, I don't know. I just wonder whether there are different patriotic visions. And there are certain people who you would call liberal metropolitan elite who have mm. a different vision of Britain. Did you see the Paddington Bear movie last year? No. Terrific movie with a kind of a rather sort of moving, in a sense, a proclamation of the virtues of multiculturalism, which I know you hate because he's a bear and he's different and he feels what, very at home and what, is made what, to feel what, welcome I think, here. I think usually now, the word, would I, that be a sort of metropolitan think, elite uh, movie that is kind of well, a think, tragedy um, of a, a travesty of British patriotism well, and well, British I think values? The fact that you throw the word in hate like that as a sort of off-the-cuff comment. But you have if, lots of insults as if, of as if, as if, of course, uh, Mr. Farage hates things. Where do you, what's your evidence? Well, for you that? said in, in, in your what manifesto, your, your you evidence? say multiculturalism is divisive. What is your evidence that I hate it? So but you say it's I mean, divisive. You, no, no, no. you say you've it's a politically used, correct experiment. You have a just, political correction well, experiment. You've called it. You've just used a very strong word, and, and and I'm picking up on it. I don't hate anything. You don't hate multiculturalism. I don't hate multiculturalism. But you don't like it. Can I, I think say, can we, we go have, that far? We, we have made some real mistakes with state-sponsored multiculturalism and division within society, and that's something. That's something which, when I was saying it a few years ago, was considered to be dreadful. Now people like Trevor Phillips say it. Look, was it patriotic to support Mo Farah when he won his gold medals in the Olympic I Games? I thought he was fantastic. I thought the interview, the interview after he'd won that second uh, gold medal, and it was the sat that Saturday mm. night, and we were all there cheering at home, you know, watching it. And there was a, there was a you know, reporter uh, interviewed him and said, well, you know, wouldn't you really have rather you know, won this medal? Right. Well, that wasn't, um, he wasn't metropolitan and, and, elite and, that and, and, and Mo Farah's answer was, listen, mate, you know, I have made this my home. I am British and I'm proud to... And, one of your and, candidates, and one I of your think, local government and that candidates... I think, that, I think, that I think really did epitomise right. what, this country, what this country can and right. should be, what and with the right. One of local government candidates, one oh, of his local, listen, put on his I've, Facebook I've, I've page, no can somebody explain, I've Mo no Farah, African from Somalia, yeah, right, who trains okay. in America, won a gold medal for yeah. Great Britain. Now, is he more patriotic now when, than the um, liberal metropolitan I tell you what's interesting. who you attack for anti I tell you, non patriotic well, let me in your attack manifesto? The let me now attack the, lib the liberal metropolitan elite in the shape of you talking to me. All right? When you interviewed David Cameron, when you interviewed uh, uh, Miliband and Clegg, you know, did you go through a list of their not just council candidates. No, I'm asking about your no, no, let, his let patriotism let and the notion finish. of patriotism but it's very interesting. that you use accusing other yeah, people yeah. of being unpatriotic. It's very interesting that you do what everybody in the Liberal Metropolitan Elite does. You pick up a comment from somebody in UKIP, made on Facebook, probably late at night. What you never do 
is challenge the other leaders about why they're elected councillors you know, those other parties, and officials though, don't go are around. serving prison sentences. No one says, are no serving one prison says sentences you're unpatriotic. For paedophilia, are serving prison sentences uh, for racial assault. And yet, it, just one person in UKIP says this, and you attempt to portray that no as being one the says, party. No and one it, says you're unpatriotic. And not. No one says you're unpatriotic. You go to the US and talk about Sharia ghettos in Europe. No one says you're unpatriotic for that. You're the party that says other people are going around making <coughs> patriotism seem like a sin. I suspect yes. some people, I think, simply think you're, 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 you're living or yearning for a country that has moved on. I'm going to give you one last example, OK? This is another one. This is not about race, because I think this is about a different age in a way. Um, it's about breastfeeding, OK? Now, you called, you called it common sense that women in a public place who want to breastfeed a baby should maybe go into the corner to do that no. so, so other people don't feel <laughs> awkward about it. I mean, now tell me I why mean, the woman trying, should go into the corner. You are trying terribly I'm not, hard here. I'm, not, I'm trying to you're get try, across... No, you're the, trying terribly what? hard. Let me tell you what I said. I, said, I was asked the question about this, the, yeah. there'd been a big row with, with Claridge's. I said, look, personally, I'm not bothered about this at all. But I know... That other pe people are. But some other people are. And so the question that was asked of me, so do you think women should be sent into the toilet to breastfeed? And I said, no, I don't think that. Perhaps asked to sit in the corner. And classic of the way this operates, this is Farage is against breastfeeding mothers. I couldn't care less. Right. But would you, would you argue that it would be as suitable for people who feel awkward when the woman wants to breastfeed the baby, for them to go and stand in the corner and the woman <coughs> to stay in this where particular, she is. In this particular case, it was people who'd paid a lot of money to go to Claridge's for tea, and some of them didn't like it. But I couldn't care less. OK. Look, let's move on um, very briefly on your manifesto. Before we talk about, ask a question or two on this manifesto, your last manifesto, <coughs> um, it had your name in it, actually. You signed the bottom the 11, of the introduction. The 11 page forward You called it did. straight talking. You defended it on TV. And then yep. you then said last year, I didn't read it. It was drivel. It was nonsense. I was asked to look at a, I mean, I wasn't the leader of the UK, but I was asked to look at an 11, no, sorry, 12 page document, which I read. I thought, well, this all looks really rather sensible. And I was quite happy to append my name to it. I subsequently learned that 486 pages, I mean, not quite war and peace, but almost getting there, um, had been put up on our website and called the manifesto. And clearly, that was a massive mistake, and it was a nonsense. And it was a nonsense. But it was straight talking. That was the, the on each page, I think, of the manifesto well, last time. Was it straight talking then? Well, the, or 12, it... well, the 12 pages was, all right? But the 486 wasn't, and right. it was incoherent. And it was actually, it was actually the kind of mistake that happens with a small political party with almost no budget right. at all. These, you know, well, let's and, talk and, about to the, let's and, talk and about it takes this time. manifesto. It takes time. Let's talk about this manifesto. You've made a lot of <coughs> spending commitments in the manifesto. They've all, or a number of them have been costed. You've got a lot of savings that you yes. make in the manifesto. They've been costed. Overall, I think you save five billion, but you say you want to clear the, the deficit or the current deficit by 2017, which is going to take another 30 billion or so. Where, well, Where's that? What's the well, spot? How are well, you going to pay for Well, that? firstly, you know, we have looked at the government's future projections for what they're going to do and said we will, we, we will hopefully this time they'll keep to them um, and we'll stick with them. But there's, but, there's, so, so, but there's another factor to this, and that is one of the arguments that has been lost completely with an economic policy, which is, I know, very much your area. The argument almost is, you know, a pound here, a pound there, that if we cut taxes by a pound here, uh, there has to be a compensating increase uh, somewhere else in revenues. But actually, there is a dynamic force with tax cuts. Right. That if tax cuts are, if tax cuts are significant, and what we would propose... But, but you're not proposing uh, what we, what significant what enough ones to, be, to, be, to earn revenues rather than lose well, revenues, are you? Well, hang on, hang on, 18... Is that, is that the basis well, of your economics, well, that you're going to cut taxes 18, and hope more money comes in? By cutting taxes by £18 billion, pounds, I think there is a very strong argument right. that says that will lead to dynamic growth within the economy. And we certainly saw examples of this. You know, go going back in time, we have seen examples of this. No, we're not... Well, that's, okay. you know, so, you know, well, that's you know, a very clear statement of you, your you know, we're not to, saying, to how to get the deficit down. We're not saying... You're going to cut taxes, we're, we're deficit not saying, will go. We're not saying we're relying on it entirely, right. but I think there is a reasonably good reason... Uh, you know, 
a good basis of historical fact to think that might work. Look, just a, a couple of things. You've costed this manifesto and you've had it independently audited, but there are a lot of proposals that are not costed in there. Smaller car class sizes, that's not included in the costings. How much is that going to cost? Um, well, I think it's all costed, actually, and that uh, is why the... class sizes, isn't We've looked at the table. Well, you better not. go and have that argument with the think tank that looked at it all, all right? right. Border but, agency, but, but, an extra but, but, but of two course, and a half thousand staff? But, but of course, if you have controlled immigration, you will have smaller class sizes, particularly at You don't know what the costs particularly are. Getting schools to provide childcare, you don't... Uh, well, it's not costed. Well, we've said parents would get involved in that. That okay. actually, okay, that that's actually voluntary. what we try to do is to try, you know, we talk a lot about early years childcare in this country, two, three, four year olds, and we talk about, you know, 15 hours a week, or should it be more that the government helps with? What doesn't really get talked about is the fact that from five years old, you know, children are going to school from, you know, whether it's from nine o'clock till 3.30 or whatever. Actually, we're talking there about providing a framework where there could be wraparound childcare from eight in the morning till six right. in the evening. And that's going to cost and, nothing. And using people. That's going to cost nothing. And using people who are volunteers, volunteers, you know, obviously with, obviously with the right checks and everything else. We're just about out of time. You're, after the uh, Rochester and Strood by-election, yeah. you talked about winning dozens of MPs. I never time. said that. I'm, I'm very careful. You didn't I've say never, you ever, would. ever, ever you put didn't a number on it. You didn't say you <laughs> would. Okay. You said, can we do this in a few dozen seats or whatever the number it may be? Yeah. We can. So you referred to dozens of MPs. My question is, what are you hoping for now? We are targeting. We are targeting several dozen seats, exactly as mm. I said we would. Can Back you, at the how time many do you think you can win? What will be a good night? What will be a bad night for you? There are really three, three. criteria oh. that you will... Criteria, not <laughs> seats, right. <laughs> there are three criteria that you can, will be measured on. Have we got a decent number of people over the line in first place? Have we got more than a handful, maybe right. in a double More figures, than a handful whatever in a it, maybe, Whatever. That's the first criteria. The second criteria is what is our share of the national vote. And the third criteria, longer term for the party, is how many seats have we come second in? Okay. And what does that mean longer term for politics? We have as a party uh, through 2013 and 2014 uh, jumped some pretty incredible hurdles. You know, this one, as I look at it, is like Beecher's Brook. You know, it's a big hurdle. If we get over this and land safely on the other side, then I think UKIP's potential is massive. Right. You have said you will resign as leader of UKIP if you don't win Thanet South. Uh, do you regret saying that? Because the polls have by no means I, make it that likely. I don't regret it at all, no. Um, the truth so you is... may be in the last couple of weeks now of your leadership well, of the party. Well, you know, David Cameron could be in the last two weeks of his leadership. Miliband could be in the last two yeah. weeks. Clegg could be... I mean, look, we could all be but gone. your party you know? is often accused of being a one-man one band. One person will come through. No, look, I, I, I believe that uh, I've given everything to try to make UKIP a political success. Uh, but I have to get over this particular Beecher's Brook. I believe I'm confident and I believe that I will. You, um, I mean, must have found it very gruelling. It, it, you are a big part of what the party's public face is. Uh, you've had at least one night where you haven't been sleeping. And I, I know that I just wonder whether you're going to look forward to when all this is over and whether you're, whether you're operating at 100% at the moment. I think, to be honest with you, in the earlier part of the campaign, I wasn't, uh, and I wasn't feeling quite as sharp uh, and as fit as I should have been. And I think that's because, of, frankly, uh, in my enthusiasm uh, for UKIP to succeed in this election, I got my diary planning wrong, and I was doing way, way too much. I've, I've readjusted that, uh, and I have to say, the last two or three days, uh, I'm feeling pretty bouncy, um, back to being a bit more like Tigger. I'm enjoying it and looking forward to the next fortnight. Nigel Farage, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Thanks.